Don't waste your time studying English from a dictionary or a textbook. In today's English lesson, I'll teach you 21 idioms and phrases that American native English speakers actually use in their everyday conversations and they'll be incredibly useful to add to your vocabulary. Now let's get started with the lesson. To make a federal case out of something. Let's not make a federal case of this. To not make a big federal case about it. Now this idiom is super interesting because in the United States, you can commit a crime that's a federal crime or you commit a crime that's a state crime. Now typically, federal crimes carry harsher punishment in the United States. So one really unique thing here is we have the United States postal system. If you damage a mailbox on purpose, of course, you are committing a federal crime. And actually, even though this crime doesn't seem too crazy, it can carry up to three years in jail and $250,000 in fines. So this is an interesting way to teach you the idiom to make a federal case out of something. If someone is making a big deal out of something that you think is not a big deal, it's a minor thing, you can say, why are you making a federal case out of this? This means, why are you making this such a big issue for everyone? Maybe when you were in school, someone borrowed a pencil and another person said, hey, you took my pencil, give me my pencil back. And the person says, I don't have your pencil. You might say, you guys, don't make such a federal case out of this. It's just a pencil. This means don't make a big deal. Don't have a big fight or a big problem over this. One thing that my English language students seem to have a hard time understanding when they first hear it is why American English speakers say that they're named after someone or something. For me, I'm named after my grandma. My middle name is the same name as my grandma. That means this is the way that my parents thought of this name. Some people are named after a city, which means that their parents liked the name of a city or a place so much that they gave their child the same name. So for instance, some people are named Harris. They're named after the city of Paris. Are you named after someone? Are you named after something? An English speaker might ask you this question and sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes no, your parents just liked the name. Especially across different cultures, most cultures, their names are coming from somewhere. They're named after something or someone. To push the envelope. They didn't push the envelope. Kind of pushing the envelope there. <laughs> so when we use this idiom, we are not at all talking about a physical envelope or envelope, as I said before. You can say this word two different ways. You'll hear it said two different ways by American English speakers. I think it just depends on where you're from in the United States. Envelope or envelope. But when you say that someone is pushing the envelope, it means they're going beyond the boundaries that are already established or they're being very innovative. For instance, I always think of Lady Gaga back before she was incredibly famous. She would just try to push the envelope. For instance, one time Lady Gaga wore a dress that was entirely made out of meat, which seems really strange, but it just pushed the envelope of fashion and it made people really draw their attention to her. You could say it was innovative. I would say it's a little strange, but it pushed the envelope of fashion. Many people would say people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk pushed the envelope of technology. In the English language, we have so many ways of saying go fast. One way that I thought of the other day that's super common here is to say gun it. When you tell someone in the car to gun it, it means go as fast as they can to push the gas pedal down as hard as they can. This idiom is really typically used for just driving. You wouldn't tell your friend that's running to gun it. It's really just used when we're talking about pushing the gas pedal aggressively or forcefully. This is a very, very common phrase. When you do something across the board, it means it affects everyone equally. And across the board. Over time and across the board. You could say everyone in my house enjoys cheeseburgers across the board. 
That means everyone likes them so much. It's my favorite food in my family, for instance. Now you could use this phrase in other ways as well. You could say, everyone in the company got a raise across the board. That means everyone working in the company from people who were janitors to people who were CEOs, they all got a raise because the company is doing well. It just means in total. You could say it was not across the board. This means not everyone got a raise. Or you could say, mm, not everybody likes cheeseburgers across the board in my house. So not everyone equally likes a thing. So you can use this phrase in a positive way or a negative way. This next phrase, the bottom line, it's very important in business and it's also very important if you're having an argument with a native English speaker. If you're having an argument with someone over something, let's say you are not a very clean person and your roommate is a very clean person and they're kind of mad at you because you're not picking up after yourself. They might say, the bottom line is you need to start helping around the house too. So this means this is their most important part. This is the reason that they're mad. If you've been arguing for a long time, someone might say, well, the bottom line is this is the main problem. In business, we say what's the bottom line to mean how much money are we going to make off this deal? Maybe you are going to have some expenses in your company regarding a project. So they're going to take away some of the profit or some of the money that you would normally make, you can say it's going to affect our bottom line, which means the money or the profit that we're going to make. And usually we use this phrase in this way, in a negative way, like it's affecting the bottom line or the money that we make in a negative way. This next phrase is very crucial to know if you want to say that it is important to do something fast or it's important to do something sooner rather than later the phrase is time is of the essence and i just love the way this phrase sounds when i say it time is of the essence in a business email if you want to politely tell someone that they need to do something quickly because you're relying on their response or you're relying on their work to finish the project you could simply add in your email please complete this as soon as possible Time is of the essence. This just means time is very important. It's important to do this quickly. If people are trapped in a building and the building is on fire, time is of the essence for firefighters to get there and get people out before they are injured or before they have, you know, too much smoke in their house. Time is of the essence. That means they have to do it quickly. If you have kids, you have maybe been frustrated with them before. And this phrase in English would be super useful. So if your kids are fighting, you might say, enough is enough. This needs to stop. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. We typically say enough is enough when we want a behavior to stop because we are so frustrated with it. You can be frustrated with something else too and use this phrase. For instance, in the winter here in the United States where I live, it snows so much. And at the end of the winter, if it snows and snows and snows, I just start saying, oh, enough is enough. When is spring going to start? And when is the weather going to warm up? Because I am frustrated with the snow and I'm frustrated with the cold weather. Oftentimes this next idiom, rapid fire, is used when you're asking someone questions really quickly. So you might say, I'm just going to rapid fire ask you some questions here. This means I'm just going to ask you what's going to come to my mind really quickly. You don't have to provide super detailed responses because these questions are going to be so quick. It's like you're throwing something at them really fast. If you want to say that someone is going to have no consequences for something that they did that was bad, you can say they got off scot-free. Well, not scot-free. We got away scot-free. Now this phrase scot-free, we don't use really in any other instance in the English language, unless we want to say that someone has no consequences for a crime or just a negative thing that they did. For instance, some people say that OJ Simpson got off scot-free free when he was tried for murder. They might say this if they believe that he was guilty and he was proven innocent in court and he never had to go to jail. So he got off scot-free. 
This next idiom is very useful if you want to tell someone that they should be happier. Or if you want to describe someone as happy, you can say they are perky. If you want to tell them to be happy, you could say, oh, perk up, or I hope you perk up soon. So sometimes we use this when we're talking with a friend, but a lot of times too, we'll say that when an animal starts to act happy and excited, they are perking up. This means they're starting to be happy. They're getting perky, which is an adjective and a really interesting adjective in the English language. When someone is sick and they are low energy, when they start to feel better, we often say that they are perking up or they're getting more energy and they're improving in their mood. Riddle me this, if you don't have any money, then why are you out shopping, right? The phrase riddle me this is used when we are asking someone a question that we are confused about. This phrase is a little tongue in cheek, which just means it's, you know, it's playful. We're trying to give some attitude when we use this phrase. Or we can say riddle me this when we're asking someone a confusing question. You could say riddle me this. What's black and white and red all over? A newspaper. So you're asking someone a riddle. And if you don't get that one, a newspaper is printed in black and white, but you read it with your eyes, which in the past tense is red. It's red all over. So it's supposed to be a challenging riddle or question. If you are asking someone a ton of questions really aggressively or intensely, they might ask you in English, why are you giving me the third degree? And in English, we consider third degree to be the most harsh of something. So for instance, if you get a third degree burn on your arm, it's a very bad burn from fire or something hot that damages your skin quite deeply. So if someone you live with, maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your brother, maybe it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whoever is like, where are you going? Who are you going with? What time are you going to be home? And you are just irritated with all of these questions that they're asking you because they're being so aggressive and they're just asking for way too much information. If you know them pretty well, use this phrase, say, why are you giving me the third degree? That means just stop asking me so many questions so aggressively. Have you ever hit a rough patch in life? When we use this phrase to hit a rough patch, it means just a period of time that's difficult. Often when people are dating or they're married and they're having a lot of arguments and they're just not enjoying their relationship very much, but then they get over it and they get along again, you could say that they had just hit a rough patch and things got better. Sometimes people in life will just have a rough patch in general. Maybe something happens, you lose your job, you get sick, or you know a loved one in your family is having issues. You could say it's just a rough patch in life. Just means a challenging part of life. You will hear native English speakers use this phrase, a rough patch, very frequently. There are so many idioms that are used to say that something is complete or finished. One of my favorite idioms is to say, that's all she wrote. Got it. That's all she wrote. Cool. That's all she wrote. It's a very casual phrase and it's a very playful phrase in the English language. And it just means that's it. It's all done. And it's often used when something ends abruptly or something runs out abruptly. Sometimes at night, I tell my children bedtime stories and they'll say one more story, one more story. I will say, oh, that's all she wrote. It's all done. This is just a playful way to say, I am out of stories. It's time for bed. Have you ever blown off a responsibility? I hope not. And definitely don't blow off studying English. This phrase to blow off something means to ignore a responsibility or a job or task that you have to do. If your friend wants to get coffee with you or go out to dinner with you and they text you and you never respond, you're just blowing them off. This means you're being rude and you're ignoring them. So oftentimes in the English language, we use this phrase to mean ignoring someone or ignoring something such as a responsibility. So you could say, I had to blow off doing laundry today. This means I had to ignore my laundry, even though it's 
a really important task that I have to do. I have to clean my clothes and fold them and put away. I just blew off the task. One English phrase that I really like to use in my everyday conversations is to change your tune. If you say someone changes their tune, you're not always talking about singing when you use this idiom. You use this idiom to say that someone has drastically changed their opinion or attitude towards something. If you have a friend and you say, are you going to our other friend's wedding? And they say, no, I hate weddings. I'm not going. And then the next day they say, well, I can't wait to go to their wedding. You could say, wow, you really changed your tune. And this means you changed your attitude and your opinion of weddings really quickly. In English, sometimes we'll say, I'm going to summarize this, but sometimes in a casual English conversation, we'll say, I'm going to spare you the details. That means I'm going to tell you this really quick, like a summary. And oftentimes we use this phrase, I'm going to spare you the details, when we have a really long story that's not that important and we don't really want to tell you. Oftentimes, we are going to spare someone the gruesome details. If you say that you're going to spare someone the gruesome details, it means you're going to spare them or not tell them the gross parts of the story. We use this when we're talking about someone getting sick or someone getting hurt very badly. I'll spare you the gruesome details. That means I'll tell you the story quickly, but I'm not going to tell you the gross parts. Hit or miss. If you want to describe something that does not have consistent quality, you can say it's hit or miss. Some restaurants have hit or miss food. That means it's either a hit, which means it's very good. In the United States, when we want to say that something is very popular and great and awesome, we can say it's a hit or it's a miss, which we typically don't say things are a miss, but in this phrase, we just say it's a hit or a miss, a miss meaning very bad. So some pizza places will have the best pizza when you go, depending on who's cooking it, it might be a miss, which means it will be very bad. If you go to a market or a grocery store to buy fruit, sometimes the fruit will have a really good quality, it will be delicious and fresh, and sometimes it will be old and starting to get rotten. So we could say the fruit is hit or miss at the grocery store. Sometimes instead of saying that it's not a big deal to do something, in the United States we'll say, well, it's not a crime. One example I can think of is if someone is indecisive. This means they can't decide on something. They'll say, I like chocolate and vanilla, I can't decide which piece of cake I want. You could say, well, it's not a crime to have both. This just means, you know, there's nothing bad about having both. Like you don't have to decide. So if you want to tell someone that something isn't bad or it's not a big deal, you can say, well, it's not a crime. And this is just a playful way to tell them that they can do something that they might think is bad, but you're saying it's okay. A really useful phrase in English is to say, read between the lines. Read between the lines, Theo. Yeah, but read between the lines. This phrase means that even though someone is doing something or saying something, you can just kind of tell from the context or the subliminal things that they're saying that they mean something else or they're kind of revealing a secret if you read between the lines. If you have a friend and they say, oh, I just want to go window shopping today. I don't, I don't want to spend any money, you know. I don't actually need anything. You might read between the lines if you know them pretty well and just the context of the situation and you say, I think they maybe just don't have a lot of money right now. Maybe they're a bit poor. Now, of course, you might want to say this to your friend's face, but if you're reading between the lines, it means that you're able to understand something that the person did not directly say. You now know 21 more English phrases that you can actually use in your everyday English conversations with native speakers. If you guys want to learn more English phrases just like these, check out the lessons on screen next because I have hundreds of everyday phrases that you just can't learn from a textbook or an English dictionary. Check out EnglishWithKayla.com too to learn from my English course. I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Goodbye!